Thank you, everyone. Um, today we are announcing 19 new cases of COVID-19 for a total of 5,932, three new hospitalizations for a total of 577, and two new deaths, both related to long-term care facilities. Um, we have one outbreak to close out today. Um, that is Bedford Nursing and Rehab Center. Um, it, their outbreak is officially closed, which leads leaves six remaining facilities on outbreak status as of today. We have no new outbreaks to add to our list. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Um, we were just discussing before, and I think we're, we have six, six out facilities with outbreaks in the state, um, and obviously we're going to keep putting a lot of emphasis on those facilities, but out of over 200 facilities uh, across the state, uh, just our hats off to all the folks. Uh, especially, especially a lot of the frontline workers working in those facilities, uh, managing some of those outbreaks and really, I think, getting us to a, a, a positive place, constantly moving in a positive direction. Um, 19 new cases today, and, you know, that's 19 more than we want to see, but clearly uh, we're still on a positive track with our numbers. Of our, we said we suspect our numbers will go up at some point, but, um, you know, I think the people of the state have continue, continue to do a terrific job helping manage um, the COVID uh, spread within their communities. Um, a few things we want to talk about, and then we'll open up for questions. First, <clears throat> the Self-Employment Livelihood Fund Program, we call it the, the SELF program, uh, which is really a offshoot of the Main Street Relief Program. The Main Street Relief Program, as a reminder, was a very successful program, put about $330, $340 million into businesses, thousands of businesses across the state. Uh, those checks have all, all been received, and we heard a lot of requests for those that are self-employed to also be able to participate to make sure that their businesses can have some uh, financial relief, and we want to be able to provide that. Uh, so that application process did begin as of yesterday. It will go until July 17th, uh, as a reminder, um, and we just want to make that opportunity available. And you can go, if you are a self-employed individual, you can go to revenue, re, sorry, revenue.nh.gov, R-E-V-E-N-U-E.nh.gov uh, for that application process. It's extremely similar to the Main Street Relief Program application process, which again was a very, very simple program, uh, simple process. We wanted to make it easy and streamlined so bureaucracy didn't get folks hung up and it allows the, the funds to be released that much sooner. So for the next uh, 10 days or so, uh, people can go on to revenue.nh.gov uh, to apply for the self-employment um, uh, business relief program. Um, also, uh, speaking of employment, uh, I, we got some more un unemployment numbers uh, came out uh, in the past couple days. And again, New Hampshire uh, keeps seeing some very, very good progress in terms of how we flex open our economy, balancing the issues of public health and safety. The state last week saw 4,800 new claims for the week ending June 27th, which is an 11 percent decline uh, week over week and a nearly 90 percent decline since our highest peak uh, when this, uh, the epidemic first started. So we're making a lot of progress. Uh, nationally, there's about a 1 percent decline in new claims, and we're uh, at 11 percent. So that was great, um, even when you compare us to the rest of New England, uh, we are far and away moving faster. I think Connecticut was about 1 percent, Maine 5 percent. 5%, Massachusetts 3%, Rhode Island, Vermont uh, 3 and 2% respectively. Um, but we are seeing some of those, those largest declines uh, around. So people are getting back to work. We're flexing things open. We're doing it smart. We're still not seeing a, an outbreak of, of COVID in the communities. We're not seeing those numbers rise just yet, which is a, a good thing. And so uh, all that positive data shows that as a whole, New England as a whole, I think is, is reopening. We're reopening safely. Uh, and we want to keep seeing those downward trends. So a lot of, lot of opportunity out there, a lot of jobs out there, frankly. Uh, for folks to take advantage of. Um, another area we want to touch base on before, there were some uh, questions and discussion uh, f following last week when we really tried to be very transparent, outline what we think the revenue uh, situation with for the state government, for the state is, uh, we anticipate just over a $500 million um, uh, loss in revenue that we will see between essentially when the COVID pandemic started up through June of next year when our budget, uh, you know, traditionally we'll have to go into another budget session. So we have a lot of a lot of tough decisions to make and we've talked about the federal government. Hopefully they'll live up to their promises, come in and, and help the state uh, replenish some of those revenues. But we still know there'll be some tough decisions to make. Um, and we've always been at, at risk of what we, uh, the business tax triggers. We don't have sales tax here. We don't have income tax here, nor should we. But we do have business taxes. And part of the last negotiated budget was the idea of that if revenues hit didn't come in at a certain point, 
that business taxes were going to have to go up. And nothing I endorsed by any means, but part of the negotiated process. And the fear really was that given our very severe uh, budget uh, or, or revenue projections, uh, that unfortunately those tax triggers were going to go into effect. I wrote a letter to the legislature. I asked them and pleaded with them to um, basically change that rule, change that law. It's really the worst time to raise taxes on anybody is when they're down economically. Families, businesses, they're all uh, hurting economically right now, and it's really the worst time to ask more of them. The uh, leadership of the legislature uh, re rejected that request. Um, they said that the, those business taxes were going to be raised. And we really put ourselves into high gear to manage, to make sure that we're providing that opportunity to reopen our economy, hopefully increase, increase our revenues to the point where uh, those business tax triggers wouldn't be hit. And I'm, I'm very happy to announce that, at least on a cash basis, we're not audited just yet, but it looks like we are not going to hit the business tax increases. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am about that um, because it would just be the worst time and the worst thing you could do. So it looks like we're going to come uh, come under those tax triggers by about $15 million. June, uh, May was a, a better month than anticipated. Uh, I was talking to some business restaurant owners in June. It looks like June's numbers are going to come in pretty strong as well. Um, uh, still below what we anticipated, but not so far below that these new business tax increases would have to be thrown upon the citizens and the businesses of the state. So it's, it, I think it's really good news. Uh, it all has to be audited and checked and double checked. We dot the I's and cross the T's with our Department of Revenue Administration on an accounting basis. But right now, uh, it looks like, uh, cross our fingers, cross our fingers and knock on wood, uh, it looks like those business tax, tri big business tax triggers will not be hit. Uh, I think a very good, a good sign for all of New Hampshire businesses. Um, with that, we can open it up for questions. Governor, yeah. um, the latest, obviously, in the, the Trump uh, rally, the President Trump rally happening uh, this weekend, some of the local officials in Portsmouth are suggesting that you implement a mask requirement on gatherings uh, 50 or larger. What's your, what's your reaction? Uh, we've treated all gatherings in this state uh, from the time the pandemic began to today the same whether they were the Black Lives Matter protests, whether they were protests on the State House lawn, the State House lawn whether it's uh, a political rally, whatever it is, everyone's always treated the same. So to have a mask order for one and not the other uh, isn't fair, it doesn't make sense. Uh, we really push, um, and, and I've been very clear over the past 48 hours that we expect folks to wear masks. Their masks are going to be handed out at that event. Uh, we're going to make sure hand sanitizer is there. We've heard from the Trump campaign that they'll be wearing masks themselves, which we're very happy to see. Um, you know, I'll, I, I suspect I'll be there uh, to greet the president um, when, when he arrives, as, as I always have, and I'll be wearing my mask. And so, you know, we, whether it's a, a, you know, a mandate or, or not, we want people to understand um, it's important. It's important that they do their best to maintain physical distancing, wear the mask. Um, but that's the same message as we've had uh, since the beginning of, this, uh, the, the, beginning of, of the, uh, the pandemic. What is different about this event is that this might bring people from outside New England. And, um, I think all the protests had the chance to bring people from outside New England, absolutely. But do you feel that uh, it's important for them to have quarantined for 14 days, including the President of the United States? It's a one-day event. The quarantine isn't in place for, for one-day events. People come over, drive over our borders, can drive in and, and shop at our stores, and they leave. The quarantining, the 14-day quarantine is in place for those who stay for an extended period. And it isn't even in place for, for those from New England, and that's... I think the vast majority of people that will be at this event will be from New England. So, But if you're just coming in for an event or to go shopping, the, the quarantine provision doesn't apply. Does Commissioner Chivinet, um or uh, Dr. Chan have anything to say about um, the risks of super spread from this event? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. It's about uh, super spreaders. And so we know that uh, there have been reports of super spreader events happening. Um, it, it doesn't take a large crowd of people necessarily to cause a super spreader event. And just for, for people that may not be familiar, super spreader events just refers to the, the possibility that a single person can spread COVID-19 to, to multiple individuals. And, and we never have uh, a way of knowing who that might be or a person's likelihood of spreading it, uh, which is exactly why, you know, whether we're talking about a rally or a protest or any group gathering, um, it, 
people at those events need to take the appropriate precautions that the governor just highlighted, you know, mask wearing, hand hygiene, uh, you know, trying to maintain a distance of at least six, people, uh, six feet uh, from other people because we know that not only can people transmit COVID-19 when they're asymptomatic, right, estimates put that number at about a third of people with COVID-19 may be asymptomatic, meaning without symptoms, but there's also, we, uh, also the possibility for super spreaders, people that can have the potential for whatever reason that we still don't understand, have the potential to spread it to multiple other people. Yeah. Would, would you recommend that the governor um, not attend the rally? So I, I think that the governor's um, recommendations that he just stated uh, apply to, um, you know, any event. I, obviously, uh, you know, people when they're at event need to take the appropriate precautions, wear a mask, um, practice, you know, good hand hygiene, uh, stay at least six feet from other people. Um, you know, it is, it is important for the governor and anybody to um, take those steps, myself included. Dr. Changes, re-asking a question we asked a couple weeks ago. Is contact tracing revealed any transmission at all from some of the large gatherings we've had in New Hampshire, be they the reopened New Hampshire folks or Black Lives Matter? Yeah. Um, so we continue to conduct a public health investigation on each and every person who's diagnosed with um, COVID-19. Uh, I'm not aware of um, a, a, any significant number of cases or, or any cases that have uh, any people infected with COVID-19 that have come from large gathering or large events. That's not to say that the risk isn't there, um, just the limitations of our public health investigation may not be able to clearly identify linkages. Um, but I think we keep going back to the fact that, you know, any Anybody attending any kind of group event, um, whether it's a protest or a rally, needs to uh, wear a cloth or should wear a cloth face covering, should be practicing frequent hand hygiene and trying to maintain a distance of at least six feet from other people. Just how does that fact inform your opinion, I guess, uh, of more of these gatherings moving forward? Does it solidify any kind of thought that with appropriate masking and hygiene, that it, it's I'm not going to say safe, but it's like the risk is dramatically reduced? Yes, so when we think about um, preventing transmission of COVID-19, right, there's not any one um, specific step or intervention that is going to totally eliminate the risk of, of COVID-19, um, which is why we have multiple, we try and incorporate multiple layers of um, protection into the, the guidance that's out there, right? We don't just rely on testing, although testing certainly is a, is a component of trying, trying to identify infection early and prevent it from being transmitted to other people. We don't just rely on masks. We don't just rely on people keeping a safe distance of um, six feet from other people. We try and have multiple steps and multiple measures um, in place. And I think that's what you uh, see talked about here uh, frequently, um, recommendations for the rally, uh, recommendations for any business reopening is having multiple layers of protection in place. Um, and with those layers of protection, the, the risk should be substantially reduced. You know, and included in that is trying to limit group sizes, trying to keep you know, social physical distance, um, trying to hold uh, events outdoors when possible because of better ventilation. Um, those are all steps that are important to take to prevent transmission of COVID-19. Will you be working also with the Trump staff um, uh, as you have for the New Hampshire Motor Speedway event and other big events to coordinate um, a safe uh, way to um, provide um, public safety for this event? So I'll let the governor speak more about working with the um uh, the, the Trump staff, I have not personally been in contact with, um, you know, the, uh, the, the federal group that's coming to New Hampshire, but, you know, as always, we will continue to work with and support our, our uh, local public health partners um, to, to see how we can work with the, the city and, um, you know, the groups locally to support their efforts. Thanks. One quick follow, Dr. Yeah. Chan. Sorry. Uh, it sounds like this event will be at least in a hangar, having a lot of air circulation, perhaps open air uh, in some aspect, but it's going to be after sundown. Does it make any difference with the, uh, I mean, the sun being up or down with the UV light and coronavirus? Is there any perspective there? Yes, yeah, so, so it's not clear how, you know, hosting an event during the day versus at night may, may impact. Um, the risk of transmission of, of COVID. Uh, you know, I think that the more important thing is to try and have uh, large gatherings, large events outdoors when possible. And, and the primary reason for that is because of uh, increased or improved ventilation, better air circulation, um, which, which we believe lowers the risk of COVID-19 transmission. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, so there's a lot of waste related to COVID and uh, precautions and protections, things like masks, gloves, plastic bags, wipes, you know, et cetera. Um, so there's sort of a two-part question here. The first being, 
how, will you do anything to both assess and address environmental impact based on COVID-related waste? And the second being, are you prepared to let the state use uh, reusable bags in the grocery stores yet? Oh, interesting. So uh, just in, from a trash perspective, so the, I guess there's two, two areas of waste that I can think of with COVID. One is where you're talking about uh, masks or gloves things of that nature there's also the waste i guess that would be connected to the the medical waste if you will in, in testing facilities and whatnot um so you know early on i, I i'm going to digress a little bit with an anecdote early on we saw uh, or i and i saw some complaints of folks saying well there's a lot of masks in the in the grocery store parking lots because people are bringing their masks into the grocery stores and then they, they throw them on the ground and so we did a bit of a public service announcement over a period of a couple of weeks to remind people to to you know kind of take their trash home and make sure they're not throwing things on the ground. So um, I don't think we've looked at it from a statewide perspective, but obviously there's a strong message, I think, that, that should be born, I think, out of your question. Yeah, everyone has a responsibility. If you're using gloves or masks or um, anything that is disposable in nature that deals with whether it's the COVID epidemic or, frankly, anything in life, I think it's just a good personal responsibility to remember just because there's a COVID epidemic going on doesn't re, re, uh, remove our personal responsibilities of, I think, being smart with our trash and, and understanding we're a very environmentally conscious state and uh, just speaking for our state, and we have to take that very seriously. Um, I, oh, and the reusable bags. We haven't made any decisions in terms of going back on and allowing the reusable bags just yet. I, I got to tell you, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cautious to make any more uh, adjustments to keep flexing things open and, and whether it's using something like a reusable bag or, or creating more uh, or flexing businesses open, you know, more and more, knowing that the numbers are increasing across the country, knowing that we could be in line for another spike. So um, I don't want to have to go backwards. We, we may have to. Uh, I don't want to, but we may have to. So I think we're right now we're in a very good place in terms of the guidance that we've put out. Um, and we want to kind of let that ride a little bit. We've created a lot of opportunity, I think. I've heard from restaurants saying that they had the best June they have ever had. Um, and so that's, that's good to hear. We know a lot of businesses are still struggling, but a lot of businesses are doing well. And so, um, yeah, right now I think we're in a place where we're in a holding pattern. And uh, I'm cautious, I'm a little cautious, extra cautious about flexing more things open, whether it's a reusable bag or, or more business uh, opportunity. Just to follow up, though, given the extent of opening that has already happened, I mean, maybe this is a question for Dr. Chan, but is the risk any higher with a reusable bag than, say, a server handing your food at a restaurant, just mm. to compare the risk? I yeah. Know. Um, I think, uh, I, so I, I'll let Dr. Chan answer if he wants, but uh, the risk that, I, that we have always seen uh, with the reusable bags are going from one person, uh, 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 someone who's bagging, the actual bagger themselves, even though they're wearing gloves, they're putting your hands in your bag, then the next person, then the next person, then the next person, then the next person. And so it's really, it's not so much about the individual who's bagging your groceries to you or you to them. I mean, that there's a concern there, of course, but it's also a concern that you're really transmitting something from surface to surface to surface. Uh, it could be someone that comes, you know, 10 people down the line from you. And so that's one, that's one of the concerns. I don't know if, I mean, maybe that parallels a little bit in a restaurant in terms of making sure that if they're, you know, changing their gloves and, and whatnot. I imagine it's similar. It's, it's a surface contact. Um, I think we know that, you know, there, there is still the possibility to, uh, for a virus to live on a surface. That's just un the unfortunate reality. Um, and so whether it's a server passing it to you or, or something in a grocery store, I think there, there is risk there to be sure. About a month ago, before um, the president's first rally, we asked you about this matter, and you said you wouldn't, you wouldn't attend any rallies. Um, the president's in, first rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oh, the one in Oklahoma. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, will your schedule permit you to attend the rally on Saturday night? Do you feel yeah. safe and comfortable? I, yeah, I can tell you. I'll be there. I'll, uh, my plan right now is to be there to greet the president. I don't know if I'll be in the large gathering of the rally. I I, I tend to avoid those types of. Uh, situations as much as I can. Um, uh, I mean, I, I've been in a few large gatherings, but they're they're kind of few and far between. And um, you know, that's you know, the president will be here for his rally. But as the governor, I'm always there to, um, and I think any governor should always be there to greet the president. And we'll be there to do that. Governor, you talk often about uh, your concern about the possibility of surges and uh, what could come. Um, given that this rally has the potential to attract thousands of people. Do you think, what do you think about the responsibility on behalf of the president and what message do you think it sends for yourself to attend this type of event? You haven't mm -hmm. attended other protests as far as mm -hmm. I know. Uh, in the well, this isn't a protest, understand. Yeah. Right, so 
what message do you think it sends mm -hmm. to be there as a leader, to be in a crowd of thousands of people? Again, I, I, I'm going to go and be, greet the president as the governor. I, don't, I, don't, I will not be in the crowd of thousands of people. I'm not going to put myself in the middle of, of, of a crowd of thousands of people. If that's your question specifically well, to myself, I try to, unfortunately, I mean, I, I, you know, I have to be extra cautious. As the governor, I, I try to be extra cautious for myself and my family. And Do you think it's responsible for the president to hold such an event? Well, I, from, from, the, the, well I, from the president's point of view, I don't want to speak on behalf of the president, of course, but he's flying in in terms of his health and safety. I, my sense is he's flying in walking onto the stage, giving a speech, and flying out. I mean, he's not really interacting within six feet of, of the crowd or anything like that, if, if that's the question. So, I mean, you know, his health and safety is obviously quite paramount as well, and I believe logistically that's how it's going to work. Governor, can you give us a sense of the timeline on school guidance? Uh, we're yeah. seeing a lot of questions on that, when we might see something. I, I was uh, reviewing the school guidance document all weekend um, a little bit, uh, just looking at structure and, um, you know, just to take a step back uh, and then we'll kind of look at where we're going forward. Uh, the task force that was put together with uh, pretty much everybody from every stakeholder group you can imagine was part of that uh, uh, process and it's really looking at the things that they wanted to highlight within that, that guidance document. I think uh, Commissioner Edelblut and his team did a very good job making sure they incorporate all of those ideas that were a part of that task force, from teachers to administrators to parents, superintendents, um, students themselves. I mean, everybody really had a say in it. And so uh, it was, it's a pretty robust document. Uh, our team went through it. Uh, the Commissioner Edelblut's team went through it. And I believe it's moving on. It's, if it hasn't already, it's already on Dr. Chan's desk. It's, I imagine he's going to need a couple days to, to, to look through it as well. And uh, we'll make any adjustments. And obviously, we always kind of leave public health as one of the, one of the final um, you know, view, reviewers, if you will, to make sure that what is being recommended um, uh, lines up with public health and safety. I'll say this uh, without giving too much of a preview because I don't know what the final document will look like. I, the task force that really created this document, I think, did a very good job trying to create something that was practical, something that was manageable for teachers and administrators without saying this is the absolute uh, rigidness you have to you know, live under, and if you don't, you can't operate your classroom. Knowing that a lot of classrooms might have a challenge with six feet, knowing that, you know, how are we going to manage mass and whether they should, should be mandatory for this population or that population, what are the, how are the teachers going to manage that, how do you manage folks coming into the school if someone has to drop off a child, how do you handle bus transportation, how do you handle, handle extracurricular activities. They did a great job putting everything on the table, knowing that, um, uh, there has to be some flexibility at the local level, which we champion in this state. We're, we're known in this state for having a lot of flexibility at the local level. We want it to work. And I think they, I, I, I'm kind of speaking for them a little bit, but I think the task force really wanted to acknowledge we want parents and communities to be able to get their kids back to school in a safe way uh, with good hygiene practices, physical distancing uh, practices, masking practices, all of that. Uh, but they also wanted it to really be manageable and to work and, and not have it fall apart, you know, in, in the early onset. Um, how you handle kids if they are COVID positive. All this was taken under consideration. So the hope is to have something out either late this week or early next week that's still, uh, that was always been our plan and that still, is, I think, is on track. I mean, we'll see. Um, you know, we're counting on uh, public health. They always do a great job with these guidance documents uh, to, to take a look at them and we'll hopefully finalize very, very soon. Would it be an opportunity for the public to comment? on the um, results of that? Uh, well, the task force, I mean, the public comment came in as part of the task force, and so, I mean, they did a survey to f over 50,000 people in the state just to get their feedback from parents and teachers. I thought that was a pretty uh, bold endeavor, and they did it. I think they did a great job, and then took all that input, included it as part of, uh, of what the task force put together. Yeah. Do we have some questions on the phone, maybe? Next question comes from Justin with ABC. Justin, please go ahead. Hi, Governor. Justin, go ahead with ABC. Um, are you encouraging the president to wear a mask at the rally? And would you feel more comfortable if, when you greeted the president, he was wearing a mask? Uh, well, anytime, anytime, whether it's the president or just someone attending a rally or. Um, Again, I, I don't really discern other than to say if you can't maintain, um, a, you know, a consistent physical, a, a consistent separation of six feet, uh, you should you should be wearing a mask. Yeah, and so I I, I don't I'm not going to make a rule for the president and a rule for the public. Everyone I think has to uh, should abide by that request that we've made to to everybody, which is why we're handing out masks at the at the event. There'll be hand sanitizer at the event. We're encouraging. 
uh, the physical distancing and encouraging people to wear the mask where that physical distancing might not be possible. We know it's not always possible, um, but um, you know, I'm not sure exactly what, what the logistics of the president arrival will be, my, but I, as I said earlier, my understanding is he'll be arriving on plane, he'll be uh, exiting his motorcade, you know, entering the, uh, going onto the stage, and, and then leaving the event. It, it isn't really a mix and mingle for, for the president. I mean, I'll wear a mask because I, I tend to do that in public when I can. Uh, so is it appropriate for the campaign to hold uh, for the president to hold a campaign rally? Look, it, the president of the United States is, is running for office, and um, and there have been other campaign events held in this state um, for lower offices, and now we have one for the president. Uh, my campaign is actually finally back in full gear. Um, I wouldn't say full gear, but it's we're we're getting we're getting going um, in, in on the weekends and, and what we can do. But uh, so no, I, I don't think it's I wouldn't say it's it's inappropriate as long as. Um, you know, similar to other large events and gatherings, uh, we're treating everybody the same. Everybody has to play by the same rules. And the rules are, you know, we encourage people to wear a mask if they can't keep the physical distancing of, of six feet. And so whether it's a campaign event or a Black Lives Matter event or a protest on the uh, State House lawn to reopen New Hampshire, whatever it is, we've never, we've never said no to those events and we've always held everyone to the exact same standard. Next question is from Nicole with CBS. Nicole, please go ahead. Thanks for taking questions, Governor. This is Nicole Skang with CBS News. Um, two questions for you. What is your message to Granite Staters who are above the age of 65 or otherwise health compromised? Should those folks stay home? And also, separately, do you anticipate any protests? And will there be any state law enforcement resources deployed for security around the rally? Sure. So uh, New Hampshire moved to what we call our safer at home advisory, uh, as opposed to the stay at home order that was in place for quite some time. If you're if you're elderly, I'd say over the age of 60, you should stay home. If you do not need to be out of your house, uh, if you can be isolated, you absolutely should do so. Um, uh, to be in a large crowd gathering is a risk that that individual, I, I, you know, doesn't need to take. Frankly, um, it's not the law, but uh, it is a, a very smart move, and that's where exactly what the safer at home advisory is all about. It's about those individuals that are older or have compromised uh, um, immune uh, um, uh, immune conditions. Um, I apologize. What was the second half of the question? I apologize. Uh, just about law enforcement. Oh, sure. Plan on sure. So uh, we there we as with a lot of campaign rallies, uh, we anticipate there will probably be some sort of protest or something like that. Um, I know uh, I was on the phone today with everyone from state police, national guard, some of the local police departments that have jurisdiction in that area, uh, coordinating uh, with DOT, with everybody. A lot of different agencies come and come to play. But anytime the president uh, arrives, we are we are always going to make sure that we have a strong uh, law enforcement presence. Um, if the protests are, can happen in a safe and productive way and then that's fine um, but we'll make sure that we have a, a strong presence there uh, regardless. The next question is from Ryan with CNN. Ryan, please go ahead. Hey Governor Ryan, over from CNN. Thank you for your time. Um, the question I have two questions for you. The first question being, did your administration or your health department have any direct conversations with the Trump campaign uh, prior to their decision to put the rally there on Saturday? And then I'm also wondering if you can explain what the buck between the specific real guidelines that your administration has put out, for instance, uh, with, you know, big gatherings such as this, like, for instance, a concert or, uh, you know, they're not allowed currently under your reopening guidelines, uh, but somehow, you know, this rally is, and you know, your comparison to the to protest things on those lines. But this is something that's organized ahead of time to put that as a confined venue. I'm just wondering what the thought process is there you know, from the, the guidelines that have been issued specifically by your administration. Uh, sure. So. Um, right now there is not a limitation on large public gatherings in the state. Um, there is a limitation on capacity for something like a concert. I believe it's, I believe we do it at 50 percent. Um, I think we, the NASCAR race, for example, has guidelines that are even, uh, you know, we, stricter than that, and that was their choice and their recommendation, uh, which is smart. So, um, you know, 
this event is taking place within those guidelines. And, and again, it's the guidelines really mandate that if you are going to have a large gathering, and, and I don't mean to be repetitive, but it, I think it's a very important point. Whether it was the protests of last month, whether it's the rally of this week, or another event down the road, right now we allow those, those to happen and we're um, having people make sure that they can maintain their physical distance. We encourage them to wear a mask. Um, so it's, it's all, it's, we're treating everybody the same. We're, 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 we don't pick and choose winners and losers uh, or, or whose voice is more important. Everyone is treated the same with the same respect and the same sense of security. Yeah, first my question for Dr. Chin is what can New Hampshire learn from what we've seen nationwide with rates of testing positive increasing significantly, but the death rate has been steadily, steadily dropping. Does, what does that tell us and how can we use that to solve a problem today like reopening schools? Uh, Governor Sunu, a question for you today, Black Lives Matter nationalized statement saying, quote, it's not lost on us that the same Governor Sununu who called us a leading voice with the right message is now welcoming a white supremacist who called Black Lives Matter a symbol of hate to the Granite State. Your actions speak louder than your words, Governor. Uh, do you still support the Black Lives Matter movement and what's your response to their criticism? So um, I'll take the, the first question about um, the uh, test positivity rate nationwide. And uh, I, you're absolutely right that we are seeing uh, the country as a whole going into another um, peak or surge of uh, the COVID-19 outbreak. I think last, last count there were at least 30 different states that um, have seen uh, increasing incidence of COVID-19 within their states. Um, <clears throat> in the last week, I think, um, on a daily um, basis, there's been an average of 50,000 new cases nationally uh, of COVID-19, 50,000 people who have newly been infected with COVID-19. So you're absolutely right that as, as a country, uh, we are seeing another surge of, of COVID-19. Now, New Hampshire in the Northeast uh, is currently in a relatively good spot in terms of uh, decreasing um, incidence, uh, we believe lower levels of transmission, but COVID-19 is still out there and it is still in our communities. Uh, and so we want everybody, we need everybody, in fact, to continue to take uh, the appropriate precautions to prevent New Hampshire from going back into another surge or outbreak situation. And that's why you hear us um, time and time again uh, repeatedly stressing the importance uh, at an individual level of you know people taking on taking seriously the responsibility of you know wearing cloth face masks when they're out in public places, staying at least six feet from other people, practicing good hand hygiene. Uh, people should stay home if they are um, having any symptoms of COVID-19, even mild symptoms, and we encourage people to go get tested. Those are the ways that New Hampshire is going to um, prevent our state from going back into another surge or outbreak situation, similar to what has been seen in many other states uh, around the country. But, but you're right that many states are seeing um, increasing cases, increasing test rate positivity. Um, the, the reports out of many of these states, and again, I, you know, I'm not familiar with the situation in each and every state, um, but the uh, reports out of a number of these states are that uh, potentially a younger age demographic is, is being impacted currently. Um, I think that there's a general expectation uh, that there will that this will be followed by uh, increasing number of deaths, an increasing number of people who have died from COVID-19 um, once community transmission starts to increase in, in different communities. Right? We oftentimes talk about. Um, uh, surveillance data and, and deaths being a lagging indicator, uh, meaning it, it can take some time, a number of weeks even, from when we start to see increasing community transmission uh, for there to be uh, a reflection in the increasing number of people who, who die from COVID-19. So I think what we've observed nationally over the last two, three weeks, um, you know, first off, there's, there's uh, you know, difference state by state, community by community. Um, and so my comments really are general comments reflective of, you know, the overall national situation. But there certainly are situations where, you know, hospitalizations are beginning to increase. And so I think that at a national level, likely we're also going to see the number of people dying from COVID-19 um, also uh, increase. I think there's over 130,000 people uh, in the United States who have died from COVID-19 to date over the course of this outbreak. Um, and again, we want to prevent that from happening in New Hampshire. Thanks. Uh, as to the question concerning Black Lives Matter, uh, we're very supportive of that message, always uh, have been from the very beginning. Um, the idea that the, the 
while they may disagree with the president on, on some of his statements and his position on things, the idea that I can somehow prevent the president from coming or that that would even be appropriate um, uh, isn't really practical. Uh, we're a swing state. This is a campaign. Uh, my guess is the president's going to come now. He's going to probably make some other visits uh, later in the year, knowing that um, that uh, this is a state to be won. Joe Biden may be here, uh, and it's he'll be um, my guess is the president will be visiting red states, he'll be visiting blue states, and we're a purple state. <laughs> so um, we still very much support the Black Lives Matter message. I think they've handled the black, that, that message themselves here very, very constructively and productively, and it's allowed us to open a lot of doors in the right way with a lot of stakeholders at the table to affect some very positive change for our state. And I, I commend specifically Black Lives Matter uh, organization here in New Hampshire. I think they've, they've done a very, very good job, not just having a message, but managing it and, and putting out there in a very uh, productive way. Governor, um, I'm going to ask you three quick questions. Uh, first, you received a letter last week from a group of black and brown business owners who say that they have not done enough outreach to ensure that minority communities know how to access all the areas to where these funds are available to the state. Um, how would you respond to that criticism? Do we take any steps to make sure um, something like the South Fund, for instance, will reach those communities? The second question is about police officers and we see numerous examples of police in New Hampshire not wearing masks, uh, both while making arrests or while monitoring a demonstration. Uh, the question is, uh, should they be wearing masks uh, simply as a matter of course? And finally, if we could just get an update on the situation at correctional facilities in New Hampshire, I think it's a little while in the future. Uh, is there any uh, new cases inside any correctional facilities? Sure. So uh, I'll kind of take those backwards if, if that's okay. Uh, so the qu first question is a, a, a quick one on an update on COVID and how it pertains to correctional facilities in New Hampshire. And I believe, no, we don't have any uh, additional COVID cases or COVID cases in within correctional facilities or outbreaks or anything like that. So that's, um, it's not that it's a non-issue. We continue to monitor very closely, but uh, right now we, we're very fortunate not to be in a position of, of having any sort of uh, outbreaks or even any any real cases. Um, the question, the second question was about police officers and law enforcement wearing masks and PPE. I mean, that's that's really up to law enforcement. I mean, one of the reasons we put the stipend in place for first responders was knowing that many first responders would have to be potentially in situations where they have to respond to emergency, they can't get their mask on, uh, they, they have to be in close contact with people or the mask, you know, can, can actually get in the way of whatever they might be doing if they're you know, giving someone CPR or whatever it might be. Uh, there's a variety of, of issues that could come there. Uh, and knowing that they were putting themselves in harm, harm's way. And luckily we've seen, well, we have seen some cases of COVID within law, law enforcement uh, and, and first responders. Uh, it isn't a, a, a massive spike, an uncontrollable spike or anything like that. Um, we make sure that those uh, individuals, those men and women that are putting themselves out there can, can get tested quickly in, in situations where there may be a question. So, um, you know, in terms of a police officer or a firefighter wearing a mask, in a in a in a situation, it, they they really have to make the best choice for themselves, um, knowing that you know there, there's communication issues, uh, whatever it might be, a lot of different situations that that can come. So uh, we obviously want to encourage them to, to wear them when when they can, and if they're in close proximity and aren't going to put themselves or others at risk, but. Um, uh, but, you know, they have to be very cognizant of that. And finally, uh, you asked a question about, I, I did receive a letter. I thought it was a really good letter, frankly, uh, from a, a, a few different individuals uh, talking about the, specifically, there were a couple of recommendations in there which were, were pretty good, uh, specifically about the access for uh, minorities and people of color to relief funds and economic opportunity, uh, relief opportunity around the COVID epi uh, pandemic and epidemic. Uh, it talked, uh, not just with that letter, but other conversations I've had in the past couple of days talked about everything from language barriers. You know, if, if uh, people uh, don't have a language barrier with English and maybe they have trouble moving through the application process, not just the Main Street Relief Fund, but other relief funds that might be out there, uh, how to access those funds and those opportunities, or individuals that are looking for rent relief or something like that. We've created all these great opportunities. We want to make sure that everyone has equal access to it. So uh, it was a very good letter. There were some recommendations in there. My hope is to take that letter, combined with what I, I hope to receive by the end of this week. I, I'm not sure, but I know the Healthcare Equity Task Force that I put together to look at some of the disparities of how COVID affects minority communities disproportionately, we put that group together 
boy, six weeks ago or so, um, don't quote me on the date, uh, and they have a report kind of coming back to us with some hopefully some recommendations about how to really integrate ourselves with those communities and those constituencies to make sure that we're providing all the resources and trying to close that gap, that ba those barriers, if you will. I think that uh, report and those recommendations combined with some of the uh, requests and recommendations in that letter could provide a lot of opportunity uh, in the next week. But we'll kind of Put, put those two together and some of the other ideas um, that we've heard out there from, from that, that community and, and see if we can create some opportunity for them and really break down those barriers um, that, um, that, that, that have existed not just through this COVID pandemic but even, even prior to that uh, and hopefully learn from it and, and kind of create a system that, that can constantly adjust and evolve and make sure we don't get into situations like this in the future. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, this is for uh, Commissioner uh, Shiganet. Uh, Commissioner, we had, uh, on Monday, they announced four new uh, hospitalizations, and uh, yet the current hospitalizations remain the same as, as they were on Sunday at 25, and they continue to drop dramatically. Even as we continue to see 20, 30, 40, sometimes 50 cases a day for the past several weeks. So given the numbers of dwindling, dwindling current hospitalizations, uh, don't they think that the vast majority of those tested are asymptomatic? So couldn't that mean we're developing a herd immunity? And couldn't that be a good thing? And one last thing, if there are large amounts of those hundreds who are being tested positive the past few weeks, can you please give us some numbers or percentages? Thank you. Okay. You okay? Yeah. All right, Commissioner, go for it. So thank you. The there There are... Our hospitalization rate is rate today, rate, rate around 25. Uh, that's the lowest active hospitalization rate that we've seen um, in this state probably since middle of March. Um, it, it, it really is great news. I do think that uh, at least a percentage of the people we are testing are asymptomatic people. And we've said that all along, that, that there is increasing evidence that more and more people are, are transmitting this virus asymptomatically. We, we see that when we go in and we test long-term care facilities and um, we're testing residents and staff that have never had a symptom and whether that's asymptomatic um, or pre-symptomatic we're not quite sure because we don't we don't track those individual cases. Um, so we, we don't track at the time of testing, whether someone's asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic, or symptomatic. So it's hard to, to give you a percentage um, exactly. The second part of that question, um, if you could just repeat that, please. <coughs> Harrison? Yeah, that, that was actually, I was just asking you if you could give us some kind of an inkling of a percentage of when they test positive, they test positive, the contract tracer calls them up, are you having symptoms? Mm -hmm. You must be putting down yes or no. So I want to try to get an idea of the percentage of new cases uh, that are asymptomatic. And you should be, I would think you'd be asking that of the contact chasers to ask the people they call. Right. If it was only that simple, right? I think it, it, at that moment, we could get that data, right? Are, are you asymptomatic today? And then oftentimes what we get is... I'm asymptomatic today, but I kind of had a little bit of a sore throat like four days ago. So is that symptomatic or not symptomatic? And then three days later, if we had marked them as asymptomatic, then they develop symptoms and then it's going back and, and reworking that case to, to put their symptoms in at that point. So I think that people have a varying amount of symptoms or no symptoms throughout their illness. And uh, I think one of the challenges we have is asymptomatic versus pre-symptomatic versus extremely mild symptoms. What we've heard from some people is, I consider myself asymptomatic, but I did have a sore throat or I did have a runny nose like a week ago. What we have a hard time distinguishing, was that allergies, was that COVID? We are starting to gather more information on that. I think that we, we may have data on that down the road, but we don't have that data right now. The only thing I, you know, he brought up another interesting point on herd immunity. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna, again, I'm going to play the epidemiologist and then I'll have Dr. Chen uh, correct me. You really need a very large, much larger percentage 
of people to be infected before I think you can have any sense of herd immunity. Um, and I'll have Dr. Chan uh, correct me on that. But just so folks know, right now about 5,000, maybe four, how many folks have been, a total, uh, our total number of infection? Almost 6,000 COVID positive, over 1.35 million people. So just to be clear, from what we know, it's still a fraction of a percent of individuals in this state that we know that have uh, tested positive for COVID. Um, this concept of herd immunity, I'll, I'll let Dr. Chan talk to that. And I think this, this question of herd immunity is one that has come up before both in New Hampshire and nationally. And I think it's important to, um, I think, be clear that the goal here is not herd immunity. Um, herd immunity is what happens when you let a pandemic virus go unchecked through a population, um, and that has potentially serious consequences, right? People are going to die. People have died from COVID-19. Um, one of the reasons why herd immunity is, at this point in time, based on what we know, probably not a, a desirable or um, viable strategy is that we really don't know the long-term um, protection when someone is infected with COVID-19, right? So if, if COVID-19 is anything like other common coronaviruses that circulate every year that can cause the common cold, we, we know from other coronaviruses, common cold coronaviruses, that people can be reinfected. Immunity after infection with a cold does not guarantee lifelong immunity. And, and we know that with common cold viruses, someone's protection decreases over time. Um, so that, you know, months after a cold, someone can get uh, a cold or get reinfected again, potentially with the same virus. Now, that, that reinfection may be less severe. Um, it may be what we could say attenuated, you know, if someone may not have as severe symptoms. But uh, it's very likely and we believe possible that when someone is infected with COVID-19, they may end up and very likely will end up being, being shown that they could be reinfected again in the future. Now, what the time frame is between when someone is infected the first time and how long their immunity lasts for, that's what we don't know. That is part of what's being studied. Uh, that's part of what's um, under investigation. In fact, before this press conference, I was in a, in a meeting um, discussing this exact issue with other states and um, federal public health partners. So this is still a very active area of discussion and debate about how long someone's protection lasts after they're infected. So herd immunity is not the goal here because people are going to die if you let COVID-19 go unchecked through a population. Um, and likely may not be a viable long-term strategy because people may be able to be reinfected again some months down the road after initial infection. Um, and so the goal right now is to control and prevent spread of COVID-19 within our communities, not let it go unchecked, um, not try and achieve some herd immunity. We want to prevent COVID-19 from spreading within our communities so that people aren't, don't end up needing hospitalization, don't end up dying from, from their disease. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. C clearly, I have a long way to go before I get that honorary uh, epidemiologist doctorate, right? <laughs> That's it for the phone? Okay, great. Any other questions here? Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, it's going to be a good week, a busy week, a lot going on, but a lot of opportunity out there. We just want everyone to stay safe, wear your mask, uh, practice physical distancing. We're in a really good place with COVID uh, here in New Hampshire. We want to keep it that way, and it's up to every single one of us, 1.35 million of us here in the state. Uh, although that number is growing. A lot of people are, we find out, are now moving here from, from the West Coast. I, I can't... That's a whole other story I could, I could tell you, but our real estate is booming. But the, be that as it may, uh, whether you've been here, you, or you grew up here, or you're just moving in, please wear a mask where you can wear a mask. Practice physical distancing. It's really up to all of us to maintain uh, this, these positive numbers. Uh, we're all nervous that a, another spike could, could befall us, but we want to put that off basically as long as we can. Uh, keep being safe and, and keep allowing opportunity for ourselves, our families, and our businesses uh, to move forward. Thank you guys very much.